So today we're going to talk again about uh, godly wisdom versus worldly wisdom. Godly wisdom versus worldly wisdom. Uh, this is Daily Nuggets of Wisdom. My name is Sean Isaacs. Good morning. Uh, we, we're going to get into uh, the book of James again today. And uh, again, I'm dealing with the subject of godly wisdom versus worldly wisdom. Morning, David. Good to see you this morning. I uh, hope you are well. I am going to get started in just a moment. And uh, again, I've been, uh, yesterday I started the subject of uh, wisdom. And uh, wisdom is a very important thing in Scripture. The Bible describes it as the principal thing. But it's not so easy to define, right, when you think of godly wisdom versus the wisdom of the world. And so, uh, good morning, Linda. And so what we're going to look at again today, I started looking at the wisdom of the world a little bit and comparing it to what the wisdom of Scripture is and why is this wisdom so important. So today we're going to define wisdom, at least seek to do it, from Scripture. Morning, Peg. Uh, sorry, I'm starting a little bit late. I, that seems to be um, what I'm saying every morning now. There's always something else to get done before I get on live, but... Anyway, good to see all of you this morning. Uh, we're going to uh, be looking at James chapter 3. And uh, wisdom is one of those subjects that is uh, critical to making decisions regarding everything in life. And um, so much so that God tells us that when we're in the midst of trials, the same book of James doesn't say necessarily to pray to be out of that trial or difficulty, but it says that, that we should ask God for the wisdom for wisdom to be able to deal with it. So I am going to pray and get started uh, this morning. We're looking again at godly wisdom versus uh, the, uh, the wisdom, the wisdom of the world. And uh, I'm just getting this text in front of me so I can kind of uh, seek to uh, speak from a place of, um, of biblical knowledge. All right. So um, wisdom in the Bible is more important than, than riches. It's more important than gold and rubies. Um, wisdom is the principal thing. It's the most important thing in Scripture. And uh, Jesus is described in 1 Corinthians 2 as the wisdom of God. He is the wisdom of God. Matter of fact, I'm going to look up that text and uh, uh, just so that I can have that, have that in front of me uh, as well. Uh, let's see if I can find it really quick. Um, I think I can. But we're gonna, I'm going to go ahead and begin with prayer. And uh, good morning again to all of you. Um, I pray that you are well. And that you are excited about God and His Word. Um, because it's the entrance of His Word. The Scripture says it's, that gives light or gives life. All right, so I'm going to pray and ask the Lord for His help this morning. Father, I want to thank you for the Word of God again. I want to thank you for... Another morning, thank you that your mercies are new every morning, and as Scripture says, great is your faithfulness. I humble myself before you this morning, recognizing that I am nothing, have nothing. I can do nothing, and I am in need of all things. I am totally dependent upon you, O God. Lord Jesus, you said without you, I can do nothing. I pray that I would be conscious of that on a daily basis, that I would be Incline, Lord, to seek you and ask you to give me this day my daily bread. I pray the same for all of my brothers and sisters, Lord, that are going to be exposed to this uh, material. At some point, I pray, Lord, for your blessings upon their lives. Your word says it is the blessings of the Lord that makes us rich and adds no sorrow. And so I invite your presence here this morning. I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to come in might and in power and destroy any yokes of bondage in our life. Set us free uh, so that we can live in a manner that would please you, O God. Your word says that, that whom, who the Son sets free is free indeed. There's no true freedom outside of you, O God. Be glorified today. Pour out your spirit and strengthen your sheep. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, again, we're talking about the subject of uh, wisdom. Uh, godly wisdom versus the wisdom of the world. And um, the wisdom of God is so important, it's critical, because it's not, the idea of wisdom in the Bible is not having more knowledge or more information. Wisdom in the Bible deals with behavior, action, 
uh, the way we live. And so in Scripture, you know someone is wise not by what they know. You know they're wise by, but by, by what they do, right? So again, the worldly wisdom is ten, tends to be seen by what people know, how much information they know, and how many facts and things they can quote. Uh, and you get this in the scriptures, you know, in the church community as well, that people are considered wise because they know a lot of Bible, right? And um, that's not necessarily the case. You may know scripture as I have over many years and uh, often did not walk in wisdom and did not demonstrate by that knowledge that I had the wisdom of God. So um, I was looking for this text and my computer froze on me. So really quick, let me try it again, uh, where the Bible tells us that Jesus is the wisdom of God. And, um, and again, I just want to take the idea of wisdom out of the realm of just, out of just uh, knowing stuff or knowledge. Because in Scripture, wisdom is something we should seek for, right? So the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1, 24, But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So Jesus in Scripture is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Interestingly enough, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The Holy Spirit is defined as the power of God. Right, so there's not one answer here. Uh, you kind of see that that all of this, or all of these things, work together. Uh, Paul says we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Right, so we're back at James chapter three, and our text is verse seventeen. And Paul, not Paul, Peter, Peter, not Peter, James. Well, wow. interesting morning. James is seeking to convince. Uh, this Jewish community of people who believe that they're wise, right? They are arguing and there's contention among them, there's strife, so much so that he begins the chapter by dealing with the tongue, right? In verse 1 he says, My brethren, be not many masters. Masters. Here he's not just referring to being a teacher. He's referring to someone who is an authority as a teacher. Now some believe that all teachers have authority, but you can teach in a sense where people don't feel obligated to submit or to listen to what you have to say. Uh, when James says, don't be many masters, in the Old English, he's not just referring to teaching. He's also referring to someone who's an authority over others, where they are inclined, generally speaking, when you are in a position of authority, people under your authority tend to be more inclined to heed or listen to what you say. So he says, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation, for in many things we offend. And he goes on to show how the tongue is the, the most difficult part of our body to control, right? Among all the members of our body, hands, feet, and everything else, the tongue is the most difficult to control. And the more mature we are, the better we can control the tongue. And this is important to understand because it helps to give a context of why James is going to refer to the wisdom of God in chapter 3, verse 4, uh, 17, and compare that, compares that to the wisdom of the world in verses 14 of chapter 3 and following. Uh, if you remember in chapter 1, James says to these same group, the same group of people, he says, um, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Now, why is James doing this? Because there is much strife in this community. See, there are people who, through their education and through their knowledge, feel that they are more superior to others. And so when they have dialogue or they have conversation, they, uh, they create strife in the midst of that congregation because of their own sense of superiority to others because of their knowledge. So James says to them, listen, um, he says, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. This is a good principle for each of us to develop in our own walk, in our own life. And uh, I was saying even to myself this morning that I need to grow in being more swift to hear, quick to hear. In other words, sometimes it's very tough if you think you know what someone is saying to let them finish what they're saying. 
All right, because you think you know what they're going to say, and so you want to get your point out. Maybe you think, I'm going to forget what I have to say, so let me just say it before I forget. But it takes great discipline to allow someone to continue to finish what they're saying, and then you speak. That shows spiritual maturity. It's very hard to develop. And James says, let every man be swift to hear, and then slow to speak, right? And then slow to wrath. And the reason he, he mentions the wrath here is because there was so much strife among these people. In verse 3 of chapter 3, uh, actually, no, he says, uh, I think in chapter 4, he talks about how they bite and devour one another. Listen to chapter 4, verse 1. He says, for whence come wars and fightings among you? In other words, where is all the fighting and the contention and the strife coming from? He says, does it not come even from the lust that war in your own members? In other words, James holds them completely responsible for their contention. He doesn't say you're invited. He doesn't blame anyone else for why they are contentious. He says it's flowing from the, con the strife and the envy and the, and the lust, the desires that are in your own flesh. He says, you lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. And he goes on to make the case uh, or reinforces why there is so much contention among these people. So back to our text in chapter 3. First of all, let's just start by asking the question, what is wisdom? Right? There are a lot of uh, people give a lot of definitions about what biblical wisdom is. So what is biblical wisdom? Well, according to the Bible or Bible teaching, Wisdom may be defined as a skill, not just knowledge and information. Wisdom is defined as a skill to apply the knowledge of the scriptures in all situations of life using the best means at the best times to accomplish the best ends all for the glory of God. So let me say that again, because wisdom is all-encompassing. Right? The Bible uses the phrase, the manifold wisdom of God, giving the idea that the wisdom of God is many color faceted, that God's wisdom has many dynamics to it. This is why you should never try to figure God out. If you're in the middle of difficulties, you may think, I'm in the middle of this difficulty because I did something wrong and God is punishing me. That may be one reason, but that could be a thousand other reasons. It could be that God needs to teach something to the world. You know, they, 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 in John 9, the, the, the disciples said, Lord, you know, what happened to this man that he was born blind? They thought they had the answer. And they were like, well, did he sin or did his parents sin? They must have believed in reincarnation. How could his parents sin before he was born, right? What happened that this man was born blind? You guys believe that someone, something can happen before I'm born? That my parents could do something. Maybe they believed on curses being passed on. Maybe. That's probably a better explanation than, than uh, reincarnation. So who sinned? Him or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus said, neither. This happened for the glory of God. Right? And so, now some hear that and say, everything happens for the glory of God. Well, God gets glory out of everything, but he's able to work everything to his own glory. But there are lots of different reasons as to why things happen. And so God's wisdom is manifold. In Ephesians chapter 3, there we're told that some things happen so God could teach things to the, to the angels, right? Um, you may not have known that, that sometimes you may be dealing with something and it has nothing to do with you at all. It has nothing to do with anything uh, on earth at all. I'm looking for this text because I suspect that for some of God's people, this may this idea may be foreign to you. You may, you may not have known this was in the scriptures. So let me read it to you because, again, sometimes we get so wrapped up in our trials and our difficulty, right? This is why God says, in the midst of your trial, what should you ask for? Not just to be delivered. All right? James says, verse 5 of chapter 1, that you should ask God for wisdom. You should ask for wisdom. Now, why should you be asking for wisdom when you're in trial? Well, if you go back to our definition, it will make sense. Listen to this. It says in chapter 1, verse 3, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh or produces patience or perseverance. But let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting or lacking nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, 
If any of you lack wisdom, in the midst of trial, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally or freely, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. In other words, you will never ask God for something, and he say, like maybe our parents said to us, get out of my face and stop asking me dumb questions. God doesn't abrade you. You can ask him dumb questions. Nothing's dumb to him. He'll hear you. Now, he won't always give you the answer that you think you need, but he will never uh, abrade you for that. All right, so um, let's see. Uh, Dave, I'm not even going to read Dave's comment. I can see where that's going. Dave, I'm going to read your comment later because that may throw me off. So listen to the text here in Ephesians. The Bible says in Ephesians 3.10, verse 9, to, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ, right? Paul says unto me, who's least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And what's the goal of this? Well, he doesn't say it's just to save sinners. But there's, a, there's another goal as well. Verse 10, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. In other words... There are some, in this case, the context, Paul says, God has commissioned me to preach the gospel to the Gentile world, not just to reveal the mystery of God to the Gentile world and the riches of this mystery in the gospel, but also that it can teach the angels, the principalities and powers can be taught about the manifold wisdom of God. Just imagine, you know, that if there was no creation, meaning mankind, can you think about it? The angels wouldn't know what mercy is. There's no need for mercy in heaven. They don't do anything wrong. There's no need for God to show mercy. So the angels, I would say, know mercy by looking at how God deal with mankind. Love. They have no definition of anything but love because God is love, right? I, they, they'd be prior to God's creation. How could they know anything else? God is love. And so they don't understand. I got to think they don't understand hatred. Until they see, they don't understand long suffering until they see God being patient with mankind. So there are a lot of things. You know, this world thing is much bigger than you and I. And the worst you can do in the midst of storms and difficulty is become a victim and, and get into this mentality. Why are bad things happening to me? Don't do that. Now, again, you may have a season of that. I'm not knocking or condemning that. We all have those feelings and thoughts and ideas and things that come to our mind. The point I'm making is that God says if, you, uh, if you're in the midst of trial, then ask God for wisdom, right? And again, what is wisdom? Let me read to you the definition again. According to the Bible teaching, according to Bible teaching, wisdom may be defined as the skill to apply the knowledge of the scriptures, not just knowledge in general. Wisdom is, what is true wisdom? Wisdom is the fear of God, right? The fear of God and the knowledge of the holy is wisdom and understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So biblical wisdom is not just skillful application in general. It is skillful application of the scriptures to everything in life. That's a distinction, See, a person who is truly wise knows how to take the Word of God and apply it to their marketing efforts in their business. A person who is wise knows how to take the Scriptures and apply it to their parenting uh, skills. They know how to apply it to the strengthening and building of their marriage. This is why the Bible talks about building a house, right? And as I think of this stuff, i got to look up the Scriptures real quickly. Uh, and, and you think of, of a wise woman and a foolish woman in Scripture. Right? God looks at how she applies her knowledge. Um, let me see if I can, hopefully I can get this. Right? It talks about how the, the foolish woman pulls down her house. Right? But the wise woman builds her house. Uh, let's see if I can find that. I'm going to try. All right? Proverbs 14. All right? And verse 1 says this. It says, every wise woman is not seen by what she knows. It's seen by what she does. Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. In other words, there are some homes destroyed 
because of the woman. Just like there are some homes destroyed because of the man. This text says, a foolish woman, a foolish woman, plucketh down her home with her hands. It's metaphorically speaking that because she is acting foolishly, she can destroy her home. A wise woman builds her house. Okay? And so again, uh, going back to this idea of what is true biblical wisdom. Right? Wisdom may, de may be defined as the skill to apply the knowledge of the scriptures to all situations of life. Using the best means at the best times to accomplish the best ends all for the glory of God. All those things have to be together to be biblical wisdom. Right? True wisdom is seen not just by knowing what to do. It's by knowing what to do in the right way at the right time. Why? Because that gives glory to God. Let me give you two quick examples. I suspect that Jesus, from 12 years old, walked into the temple on a regular basis and saw the money changers exchanging money. And he must have been bothered by that from 12 to 30. Yet he didn't cleanse the temple. Why? Because it wasn't the right time. Right? And you can do something, you can do the right thing and in the right way at the wrong time. Right? You could also do the right thing in the wrong way. Let's think of Nathan with, with David. I suspect that, da that Nathan must have knew for a little while, right? Because it is believed that David, after sinning with Beth Bathsheba, had at least eight to nine months between his sin and his true repentance. And yet, Nathan doesn't just come to David and say, you are the one that sinned against God. You're guilty. You need to repent. He that wins souls is what? Wise. See, see, wisdom is not just concerned about being right. Wisdom is concerned about being effective. I see a lot of people online that are right. But when they're done correcting, rebuking, showing other people up, they bring division among themselves. Right? And I'm guilty of this often. I have been guilty of this. I'm thinking even now of contention that my wife and I have had where I've been more concerned about being right than being effective. So, da so, da so Nathan with David was not just concerned about being right. Nathan didn't cover up David's sin and call it love. That would not be loving, right? You, can love, you must love people, but we must also love truth. We must also love God. Did Jesus love the people when he cleansed the temple? Sure. He didn't love them as much as he loved the truth, though. And really, the reality of Scripture is truly loving someone is to do the best thing for that person. Meaning, at times, the Bible says it, it pleased the Father to bruise the Son. Did the Father love the Son when he put him on the cross? Of course he did. But he did what needed to be done for the greater good of mankind. So some confuse love, and they think love just means being nice and kind. That's not love. True love suffers long. It's not easily provoked. True love will be provoked, but it's not easily provoked. So there, that's why the Bible says, be angry and sin not. It doesn't say don't be angry at all. It says be angry and sin not. So sometimes you will get angry. So again, back to our text here. So true wisdom is not just knowing what to do. It's knowing when to do what to do and then how to do what to do so that you are doing it for the glory of God. This is why wisdom is the principal thing. This is why in all of our getting, we should get wisdom. We should go after wisdom. Why? Because to grow in wisdom is a lifelong pursuit. To grow in wisdom is a lifelong pursuit. So again, wisdom is defined, if you take the Bible, encompassing and somebody else may have another definition. I'm not going to argue with them. But it's defined not just as information and knowledge in the head, right? The world's wisdom is having a PhD, having more knowledge, more information. I have a lot of books here, right? Somebody thinks that may, but that may be wisdom because I have a lot of books. You know, I have about 10 shelves like what you see behind me. That, that may just produce a puffed up mind, right? Knowledge puffs up. It may just create in me a level of superiority so that in dialogue with others, I think I'm better than they are, which creates more strife and contention. This is why the Bible says true wisdom 
is first pure, peaceable, and easy to be entreated. It's easy to persuade a wise person. They may not come over to your position where they agree with you, but they're not contentious, right? And so the point here is if we want to be more like God and more like Christ, then we need to grow in wisdom. So again, it's the skill to apply knowledge of the scriptures in all situations of life, not just some. Some of God's people compartmentalize our lives. We only use the Bible for religious stuff. Why? Why would you do that? The Bible says in 2 Peter 1, following, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, it says that, that in God's word are his precious promises that allow us to be partakers of God's divine nature. And in those promises, God says, that we become not only partakers of God's divine nature, but in the promises of God, which is more than 5,000 promises in scripture, is everything that pertains to life and godliness. The scriptures cover godliness, which is our religious life. It also covers life. The Bible teaches you how to eat. The Bible teaches you how to be healthy. The Bible teaches you how to be a better parent. The Bible teaches you how to run a business. The Bible teaches you how to win friends and influence people. Right? I've read tons of books. I say to people all the time, the best book are the 66 books of the Bible. There's nothing, no area of life that if you understood the wisdom of Scripture, you could not find an application for an area of life. A lot of Christians would say, I agree. And then you say, well, how much time do you spend reading the Bible? Um, not too much. So let's go back now to what true knowledge is. See, if you really believe that the Bible answers every, every area of life, that the Bible will show you how to find the right mate. The Bible shows you and I how to handle money, how to save money, how to spend money, how to invest money. The Bible tells you how to buy and sell. It does. Look up the words. The Bible is so filled with wisdom for every area of life. It's amazing that many of God's people... And I don't say this in a condemning way. I say this as not condemnation, but revelation. It's unfortunate that we don't understand, right? And all you're getting at understanding, that we don't understand how critical knowledge of Scripture is once it's understood in the heart and not just the head, right? So it is, again, the knowledge of the Scriptures, applying the knowledge of Scripture, the skill to apply the knowledge of Scripture in all situations of life, using the best means, right, at the best times to accomplish the best ends. Wisdom is concerned about what is going to do, be the greatest end, right? What's the greatest end? Eternal life, right? This is why the Bible says um, that we should lay up treasures in heaven. Okay, that's the best end, right? Lay up treasures in heaven, because ultimately, in the long, in the big scheme of things, this life is very short. If you live 120 years, it's great, very short compared to eternity. All right? And, and the goal of all that is to do it for the glory of God. So, um, let's go back to James chapter 3. I don't even know how much time is gone. I don't want to keep too much of your time. But, again, I, I pray that, um, that, that you would make wisdom uh, your daily prayer. I look back over my life, right? I've been walking with God now for, ooh, wow, almost 30 years. I've grown up in church all my life. I rebelled against God as a, as a child and as a teen, and I wanted nothing to do with God at a certain point because pleasures of sin were better, right? More fun, right, at the time. And then through the death of my brother, my oldest brother, I came to Christ. Um, but I look back over my life, and, you know, I probably every day of my life, this has to be the Lord. Every day I asked God for wisdom. What well, was one of my prayers every day? Like, one of my prayers every day. Every day, Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your wisdom. Fill me with your wisdom. The Bible says in um, Isaiah chapter 11, it describes the sevenfold spirit, right? The spirit of God. Jesus says the spirit of the Lord. He describes that Jesus would be filled with the spirit of wisdom. And Paul says that we should ask God to fill us with the spirit of wisdom and understanding and in the fear of the Lord, right? This thing of wisdom is very critical. Uh, I believe there are many relationships that are destroyed because of a lack of wisdom. You may know the right thing, but you need to know how to do it the right way. And this is why we pray and ask God, Lord, give me wisdom. 
you know, I have this friend that I'm saying, let's say that's you. You have a friend that you know they're doing something wrong or they're in a situation or a relationship that's not good for them. Just because you know that's the right thing, the loving thing to do is not just clear your own conscience. Well, I'm not going to compromise and I'm going to make sure I just correct them. That sounds real spiritual. You know, think about Jesus. I, imagine, imagine living at the time of Christ in the first century, that you were one of his apostles. I suspect that there was not a day that went by that he didn't see some flaw in their lives. He didn't see some sin in their lives. There can't be a day that went by that Jesus, who is truth personified, who is the light of the world personified, not just he bears the light, he is the light. Can you imagine? And he is around his disciples from morning until night. And you don't see him correcting every flaw, correcting every sin, rebuking every flaw and fault of their life. He says things like this. I have many things to say to you, but you can't bear it yet. See, that's wisdom. I have many things to say to you, but since I need to be effective and not just right, I'm not going to say it now. Jesus did a lot of praying all night. I wonder what was he praying about? You think he was just praying for sinners to be saved? Yeah, I think that's part of it. I think he was also praying for his apostles to get it. I think he was praying for his disciples, their hearts to be prepared to receive correction, to receive rebuke, to receive instruction in righteousness, so they'd be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All right, so... I'm not going to look at the text now. I'm just going to read it, right? And uh, for sake of time, uh, I want to give you some practical tips on how to get wisdom. And then, Lord willing, tomorrow we'll get back into further definition of what wisdom is. And I'm doing this because I hope that, you know, I, said, I stand up often and I speak to Christian business owners. And I say, you don't need money to make money. You don't need money to make money. You don't need even, you, you need wisdom to make money. If you're struggling financially right now, you need wisdom. Wisdom. Lord, give me wisdom. Show me, Lord. Give me direction. Guide me. Why? Because wisdom is what? The skill to apply the knowledge of the scriptures to in all situations of life, using the best means, the best times, best ends for the glory of God. All right, so let me give you, uh, I found this uh, at the, the Christian walk, and it's called the walk, the walk in Wisdom. And uh, it's how do you get wisdom? Ten ways to get wisdom. All right? I don't think time will allow me to, to expand on them. So I'll just read them, and as I feel moved by the Holy Spirit, I will, I'll expand. So here are the ten ways to get wisdom. You're in the middle of a difficulty, a trial. You're trying to figure out who your mate should be. Should I marry this person? All right? Uh, should I move to another area? Should I get, uh, change my career? Should I change churches? Uh, should I, you fill in the blank. There's not an area of life. There is not an area of life where you feel unclear that the wisdom of God can't help. Okay? And if you believe that, then you need to do these ten things. Or at least some of them. Number one, you get wisdom by asking. James 1, verse 5. Right? James 1, verse 5. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Why? Because out of the mouth of God, Proverbs says comes wisdom. Out of his mouth comes wisdom. The Bible says there in James chapter 3, verse 17, the wisdom, or verse 15, 16, the wisdom that is from above. Why does it say from above? It implies that this is not the wisdom of the world. This is not something you gain from just reading books of the world. This is why we pray when we open the scriptures. Why do we pray? Because the Bible should not be read like you read a novel. The Bible should not be read as you read a magazine or a newspaper. You know, I got tons of books here, right? Let's see, I don't know. This book is called Top Dog. Well, you can't even see it because of the light, right? Top Dog Recession Busting Sales Secrets. You know, I've been in sales 30 years, I guess, right? I've been selling all my life. I've been like an entrepreneur all my life, right? I don't, I don't open this book, though, and pray. It's like, Lord, give me wisdom before I read this book. Now, there, I got to admit, there are... There have been some books that are not religious in nature that I've actually asked God to, to help me to understand the concepts and, and give me the wisdom of it, right? Because the Bible says, for example, that the, that the sons of light are wiser when it comes to economics, money, than the, I mean, the, 
the, the people of the world are wiser, Luke 16, than the sons of light when it comes to economics and money and so on. And so, yeah, I read a lot of people that are not Christian, but my point here is that I always pray before I read the Bible. I don't always pray when I read any other book. Why? Because I understand it's a living book. It's a spiritual book. And it has insight and wisdom and nuggets of wisdom that come from above. How ironic. I call this whole series Nuggets of Wisdom. And it just dawned on me with learning and talking about wisdom today. Anyway, Peg, you said skill. That's a new definition. Yeah. I hope you don't mean it's new in the sense that I hope you saying it's I hope it's new to you and not that it's a new definition, meaning I just made it up. But uh, yeah, knowledge, uh, wisdom in the Bible is a skill. It's a skill. You have to develop it. You have to grow in wisdom, right? And that language is all through the scriptures. Um, we are to grow in wisdom. Matter of fact, that was Paul's prayers for, prayer for the, the uh, church of Ephesus. If you know the church of Ephesus, the church of Ephesus was one of the most mature churches in the first century. They were, um, it's one of the only churches that had no rebukes in those letters. The church of Ephesus they weren't rebuked like the Galatians. They weren't rebuked like the Corinthians. And yet, Paul, what does he pray for the church of Ephesus? Let me read it. Uh, Ephesians 1, it says, um, in verse 17, it says, uh, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. You would think, well, they have it already. Don't they know Jesus? Yeah, but Paul wants them to grow in that. He says that, that the, and, and this is his prayer for them, right? Excuse me. He says, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith, verse 15, in the Lord Jesus, and love unto, unto all the saints, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. For what reason? Why is Paul praying for the church of Ephesus? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, number one, the Father of glory, he identifies who he is, may give unto you. See, wisdom must be given. Wisdom is from above. Biblical wisdom is not something you get from just reading Bibli uh, uh, regular books. And that's why we say it's the applying of the knowledge of Scripture to all situations. You know, the more you understand Scripture, the more you can learn the regular things of life. The psalmist says, you through your law have made me wiser than all of my teachers. Through the study of God's word, you make me wiser than all of my teachers and, and all of my enemies and the ancients, ancients being the older people. Paul says, that, the God, that God may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. So again, as you see, I, I can keep talking, and uh, that's my challenge. It's, you know, I should always have notes when I'm teaching because uh, my mind has so many things inside of it that I can be derailed very easily, and that's not a good thing. I'm not, you know, some people like it, and some are like, praise God, keep going. My wife is like, man, you need to rein it in, bro. I'm like, you know. So, and, I, and every now and then I'm like a prophet without honor in his own home. Well, good scripture, right? So you can't be corrected. You can always, when you know the Bible, you can always use the Bible against others. So, how do you get wisdom? Number one, by asking for it. Number two, by studying God's law. By studying God's law. We'll go into these in more detail, Lord willing, in the future. Studying God's law. It's not just to read it. A key word in scripture is meditation. Meditation. The Bible says... The person who meditates on the law, not just in the morning before they go to work, not just five minutes in the car before they get to the job, not just two minutes before the meeting, right? The person who meditates in the law day and night, day and night, day and night, will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. If you're planted by the rivers of water, everywhere you go, life is. Get that? If you are planted by the rivers of water, and those rivers are life, if you are planted by the rivers of water, everywhere you go, there is life. And every word you speak has life to it. Right? Planted by the rivers of water. They'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that whatsoever you do will prosper. Whatsoever you do will prosper. That comes through meditating. God says to Joshua, right? This book of the law shall not depart, not out of your head. See, meditation has to do with the mouth. He says, this book of the law shall not depart out of your head, but, right? 
Your mouth, right? Meditate day and night. I keep thinking of these scriptures and I got to read them. And it's ironic that this was the first or second verse of the Bible that I learned. And um, because I'm sharing it right now, I got to kind of look it up because I just like to look at the scriptures. Verse 6, 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do. The goal of meditation is to do what you know. The goal of meditation is to do, right? Meditate day and night, that thou may observe, that old English way of saying, not just to look at it, but to keep it that they may, thou may observe to do all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and you'll have great success. Right? So this again why I say, or we say, knowing is doing. Uh, uh, Nellen, yes, Jesus also grew in grace and, and wisdom. Right? And he grew in stature and in wisdom before God and men. And that's interesting. Jesus, who is the wisdom of God, as a child, grows in wisdom emphasizing his humanity, right? And if Jesus, as a man or as a child, had to grow in wisdom, should you and I not seek to grow in wisdom? So again, 10 ways to get wisdom. Number one, you have to ask for it. Number two, study God's law. Three, keep God's commandments, right? The more you keep the commandments of God, the Bible says, he that is faithful in little shall be made ruler over much. That's a principle. Just like there's a law of gravity, there's a law of faithfulness. If you are faithful in little, God will give you more. If you are unfaithful with the little that you have, God will take away that which you're given. That's a principle in Scripture. Read the parable of the talents, right, in Matthew 25. God says if you don't use what you have, God will take it away. And using doesn't mean just to know it, but to live it. Again, we don't live it perfectly, but hopefully our hearts are perfect toward God and that we're seeking to do what God says. So thirdly, by keeping God's commandments, we grow in wisdom. Fourth, by fearing God. Fearing God. We'll talk about what does it mean to fear God, all right? How do we grow in wisdom by fearing God? This is why you should, you should, I'm going to say this. I hope you get this. I hope, I hope you understand what I'm about to say. Since the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the beginning of knowledge, then all knowledge in the world that doesn't begin with the fear of God should be suspect to you. Doesn't mean you shouldn't be open, right? The Bereans... They were open. They weren't closed-minded. They were open. The Bible says they receive with all readiness of mind. Right? But you don't stop there because you could be gullible if you stop by just having a ready mind. Yes, teach me, Oprah. Teach me, Dr. Phil. Teach me, Dr. Oz. Receive with all readiness of mind. Principle. Right? Because true wisdom is pure Peaceable, easy to be entreated. True wisdom is not closed-minded. True wisdom can learn from others even if they're not Christian. But here's what I said. You should be suspect. Or I don't know if that's the word I want. want. Um, let's just say you, we should be diligent to be like the Bereans, right? With all readiness of mind, receive, and then but, then but then search the scriptures to see if what is said is true. There are people who are not Christian who can say things that are true. But you have to know the scriptures to be able to discern, right? To have the maturity to go, nah, I, I disagree with that. So, if I were you, I don't know what your philosophy or way of thinking is, but here's mine. Every industry in America, I question. I question, question the medical industry. I question science. I question education. I question the Food and Drug Administration. I don't let anyone who does not begin with the fear of God tell me what I should and should not do without first filtering it through the Word of God. Right? This is why when we sat in front of a doctor who said to my wife, it's going to cost, my wife and I, it's going to cost you $38,000 for the surgery for her cancer when she was first diagnosed. And she is going to need chemotherapy and radiation, and that was going to be another hundred plus thousand dollars. And I said, Miss Doctor, if you had what my wife has, would you do what you're telling me and my wife to do? And the response had the delayed response. Uh, she did affirm, yes, but there was enough delay that made me go, I need to go back and do a little bit more research. And we researched. I put over a hundred hours of study time 
I think it was about 100 hours or more, into chemotherapy, radiation, cancer, blah, 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 common denominators of disease. And when I was done, after prayer, after fasting, after looking at the scriptures, after reading tons of books from, from secular as well as religious uh, persuasions, we came to the conclusion, we're not doing chemotherapy and radiation. Now, I'm not saying you need to go to that conclusion, but because I begin with understanding, when someone doesn't fear God, their knowledge and information is not complete. When a person doesn't begin with the fear of the Lord, their knowledge, their science, their information, their dogma, their convictions are not complete. It's not exhaustive. doesn't mean that mine is, but we, we start and begin with the Word of God. That's my point, right? We start and begin with the Word of God. And so, yes, I respect the government, I respect politics, I respect the educational system, I respect the Food and Drug Administration, I respect the pharmaceutical industry and all these industries, but I respect them all in the sense that I don't just do what they say without saying, what does the Bible say? Right? And this is, if you believe the Bible has all the answers and it can give you the skill to deal with any and every area of life, then it affects the time you spend in the scriptures and then filtering things through the scripture, right? So again, my point there is the more we know the word of God, it is the sword of the spirit and the Holy Spirit uses the word in the midst of everyday life to guide and direct us. He leads and guides us into all truth, not just the truth of scripture, but the truth and decision making as well. The Holy Spirit leads and guides us into all truth. One of my favorite, I have so many favorite texts of scripture, but I love the Old Testament text that says that he will say, this is the way, walk ye in it. God will tell you which way to walk. He will guide your heart and mind. But one of the means that he uses is the word of God. All right, so how do we grow in wisdom? Number one, by asking God for it. Two, studying God's law. Three, keeping God's commandments uh, and, and keeping them with us, right? Uh, the Proverbs talk about wearing God's, wearing the word of God around your neck like a precious jewelry, right? You keep it, my son, incline your ear to my words and hold them, right? All right, so um, fourthly, by fearing God. Number five, by reading Proverbs. The Bible says in the first few verses of Proverbs that, that Proverbs is written to give wisdom to those who are simple-minded, those who are gullible. Number six, by the way, if you lack wisdom and you think it's an area that you're weak and you uh, are easily taken advantage of, you find that people, that you have a sense of gullibility. Uh, this was me for many years because I thought being loving meant that I, uh, I was also very pliable, right? And so being loving just meant that, that I, um, I, I lacked often uh, wisdom. And I was very simple-minded. I believed every word. People say things to me and I believe them. I was taken advantage a lot, of a lot, probably the first 15 years as a Christian. Uh, whether it was money or something else, people took advantage of me a lot because I lacked wisdom. And so if that's you, I would say read a proverb every day. There's 31 in the Bible. Uh, you get wisdom by God's testimonies, by hearing uh, instruction, by seeking wisdom diligently, Number nine, by listening to rebukes, right? You got to be open and correctable if you want to gain wisdom. If you're closed-minded and you think, well, God talks to me. I don't need to hear anybody else. You know, there's, this, there's a group of Christians, millions of them in America, in other parts of the world, that are so emotionally connected to the idea that God speaks to them that they don't understand that God speaks through people also. You should never just believe every impression you got or every feeling you get, like that's God speaking to me. That would be foolish. Why? Because God says you should test all things. You should prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. You should try the Spirit to see if they be of God. The context of that is there's many voices. The devil can come as an angel of light. I would be a fool to believe every feeling and thought and impression I get and every vision and dream that I get that somehow God is talking to me. But there are many of God's people that live that way. But the Proverbs and the Bible says that a wise ear will listen to rebuke. They're correctable. Some would say, no, nah, you're wrong. No, you shouldn't get married to that person. No, you're making a mistake. All right? A wise ear will listen. Now, you may not fully heed, but at least you'll slow down enough to gain further insight and more counsel. 
All right? So lastly, by listening to rebuke, and lastly, by seeking wise counsel. That's how you gain wisdom. Well, Lord willing, tomorrow we're going to get further and deeper into the idea of, I do do this uh, on Saturday, I think tomorrow's Saturday, right? Yeah, Saturdays as well. So again, a lot of people sleep in on Saturday, um, and you're welcome to do that. And if you want to get the previous ones of these, you can go to, to uh, YouTube. Or I would encourage you, by the way, to like the uh, Live Recession Proof Now Facebook page. Uh, because soon I am going to move these away from here on my personal page to the Live Recession Proof Facebook page. All right. So uh, I want to encourage you to go there because um, probably in uh, a few days, maybe even a few weeks, maybe by March 1st or so. Or maybe I'll do it my birthday. March 5th is my birthday. Maybe that's when I'll move everything over. So, God bless you. Welcome to Daily Nuggets of Wisdom. Uh, we're looking at the subject of the wisdom of God or godly wisdom versus the wisdom of the world. I hope you found something helpful and profitable. Uh, I sure did. You know, one of the best ways to learn is to teach. One of the best ways to learn is to teach. Um, don't wait until you have figured, figured something out fully and completely. By the way, the best way to know that you know something is to teach it. Right? So uh, the more you, well, the best way to know you know something is to live it. But with that being said, the more you can teach what you know to others, the more you enhance your knowledge. This is a great uh, principle with your children, right? Um, when our kids were younger, uh, we would always have them, uh, they would take turns leading devotions, right? So we would have a devotional time. I would do most of it. And sometimes my wife would do it. And then, uh, you know, once a week or every now and then I would say, okay, Aaron, Abigail, Joanna, it's your turn. Next week, you're going to have to lead devotions. And so they're now put under the pressure to learn scripture or to take what they've been taught and now share it with everyone else. So one of the best ways to uh, turning 25, I'm sure. Happy birthday, March 5th. Yeah, yeah I'm turning 25. Uh, praise the Lord. Um, that's, that's a quarter of a century, Nellen. Uh, so, um, yeah, one of the best ways to learn is to teach. And so I say that to say the Bible is a two-edged sword. So don't give me much credit for what may sound profound or like, wow, that's pretty wise. Or, man, you really know the scriptures. I get, I get requests all the time. And over the years, people want to know, you know, where, how, how can I get your books? And how can I get this? And where's your church? And all that. And don't give me any glory. Out from God's mouth comes wisdom, Right. Uh, if anything I say resonates with you, sometimes I say stuff, and I'll be honest with you, I listen back to, to a message or, or, or I play back something or I listen back to an audio, and I'm like, wow, wow, that was, man, that was pretty good. And, and I'm not saying it's like, for me, I'm like, wow, the Lord, that was definitely you. By the way, I believe that's the, 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 the gift in, in Corinthians, a word of wisdom, Right? The, 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 how God gives a word of wisdom. I believe for a moment, God, it's not just, it's not just people think it's this supernatural gift to be able to tell somebody, God tells me that you're going to marry such and such in six months. No, I think that wisdom is knowing what to do at the right time in the right way, in the right means for the glory of God, right? Somebody may come to you with a question and immediately it's like Solomon, right? The people come to Solomon and in the moment, you know, the woman comes, two women come, and they're like, my baby's dead. The baby's dead. She killed, she slept on the baby, rolled over on the baby and killed it, and it's her baby, not mine. And at the moment, how do you know what to do? And at the moment, Solomon gets wisdom from God. I think it's like downloaded in the moment. It's not like Solomon's walking around with this great, uh, you know, capacity for wisdom all the time. At the moment, I think God gave him wisdom. And he said, okay, bring the baby. Let me cut it in half. And obviously, the true mother is going to be like, it's her baby. She can have it, right? Because she really loves the baby, all right? So anyway, um, God bless you all. Welcome to Daily Nuggets of Wisdom. Again, if anything here resonates with you, give me feedback. I want to hear from it, hear from you. If, if it does not resonate with you and, you and you disagree, I want to hear that too. Because I, I need to grow also in my understanding and in my, my knowledge. Jermaine Farrington, wow. What's up, man? I haven't seen you in ages, haven't talked to you in a long time. How is your wife? How are the kids? How's business? I know you've always been an entrepreneur. How's your walk with God? Reach out to me, man, sometime. Let's, uh, let's connect. 
uh, be nice to uh, see how you and your family are doing. And I uh, hope everything's well in the Bahamas. God bless you all. Well, welcome again to Daily Nuggets of Wisdom. If anything here resonated with you, join me tomorrow, Lord willing, at 7.30 a.m. Uh, we'll continue on comparing godly wisdom to the wisdom of this world. Dave, you hung out the whole time. I can't believe it. You must not have. I know you got a lot of work to do. But again, everyone's well. Thank you, gentlemen. Good to hear that. Um, you know, the good thing about our phones is hopefully you can, even if you're not um, able to watch what I'm saying and doing, you can at least listen in the background. All right, so God bless you all. Have a great day, and um, may the Lord give you grace to grow in the wisdom and knowledge of God. Amen.